Hey guys, welcome back. So in today's video, we're going to break down a recent interview from the director of the CDC, Dr. Rochelle Walensky. She was interviewed as part of a grand rounds for medical training and you know, internal medicine residents and students and staff over at Washington University School of Medicine late last week. I want to break down a few clips from this. I'm sure you've seen a few pieces of this as many people have shared bits and pieces of this over on Instagram and Facebook. And this was trending on Twitter earlier this weekend. Where could we have improved? Um, well, you know, I think I can tell you where I was when the CNN feed came that it was 95% effective on um, the vaccine. So many of us wanted to be hopeful. So many of us wanted to say, okay, this is our ticket out, right? Now we're done. Um, so I think we had perhaps too little caution and too much optimism um, for some good things that came our way. I, I really do. I, I think all of us wanted this to be done. Nobody said waning when, when you know, mm -hmm. oh, this vaccine's gonna work. Oh, well, <laughs> maybe it'll work, it'll wear off. So there's about five clips from this over one hour discussion that I would like to just play with you and sort of pause and talk and reflect about some of the, of the things that she says, because many of the things that she states, and again, this is one of the most powerful women in all of science and medicine right now. She's the director for the CDC. Many of the things that she talks about, we have talked about on this channel and other people have mentioned over the past 24 months, but when they mentioned it, they got deleted off social media. Those videos got flagged for misinformation. Fact checkers quickly came to the party to correct any misinformation or disinformation that was purportedly being disseminated in that content. But curiously now, 24 months later, as the pandemic suddenly has sort of disappeared, I don't know what happened to COVID, but it just appears to be gone. She seems very comfortable saying these things. And that is why I'm sharing this with you. I'm not here to split hairs. If, if someone were to split hairs about every single thing I say in a video, they would find some things that are inaccurate or that they could disagree with or that I words that I wish I could have taken back at the time. However, because so many people lost their jobs, got ostracized from society, got kicked off social media, have been unofficially removed from their families and disinvited to holiday parties and Christmas and Thanksgiving, okay, this is why... I'm sharing this with you because there has been so much polarization uh, from this whole, you know, sort of the, the policy and the ideologies that have been created thanks to our policymakers and media. I think it's worthy to listen to what she says and pause and reflect and say, well, I'll be damned. When we said that stuff, we got censored. We were told that we were conspiracy theorists, but she's saying the same things that many of us have said. So I want you to hear directly from her. I think, you know, honestly, this information is, is helpful because you probably still have family members who are scared to hang out with you because maybe you don't wear a mask or an N95 mask, or maybe you haven't vaccinated your 12 year old yet or some such thing. So I want you to hear directly from one of the most powerful women in all of health and medicine, the director for the Center of Disease Control, Dr. Rochelle Walensky. This is part of an interview again, as part of our grand rounds, and I will link the high resolution, full version of this uh, interview below. So here's clip number one. We're gonna talk a little bit more about what she says right here. I can tell you where I was when the CNN feed came that it was 95% effective. Let me just pause right here. Okay, this is a woman who manages presumably tens of thousands of people that are under her. She said later in this interview, 2,000 people, staff at the CDC, directly cover all things COVID, whether it's looking at wastewater, uh, you know, how much viral load is in the wastewater, uh, seropositivity in blood banks. I mean, they're doing all sorts of aspects of research and publication and marketing and, and, and data uh, mining and the whole thing. Okay, she's getting intel from CNN. I mean, I don't need to tell you about all the controversies over the last three months, let alone the last year associated with CNN from, you know, helping to cover up Andrew Cuomo's uh, sexual allegations, Chris Cuomo getting fired. There's all sorts of directors and producers that have been fired due to links associated with child molestation and, uh, you know, unwelcomed advances towards children. Uh, a legal correspondent over at CNN was, was uh, you know, put on leave for a little bit for either masturbating or showing his genitals on a Zoom call. And so it's a little concerning, honestly, and I'm not infusing my bias here, when some... Uh, a director for a major institution here in the US, but also globally, is saying that she gets data from CNN when she has 2,000 people working under her specifically on COVID-19. That's just a little bit concerning. 
I think you should be concerned about that. Done. Um, so I think we had perhaps too little caution and too much optimism um, for some good things that came our way. I, I really do. I, I think all of us wanted this to be done. Nobody said waning when, when you know, mm -hmm. oh, this vaccine's going to work. Oh, well, <laughs> maybe it'll work, it'll wear off. Um, nobody said, well, what if the next variant doesn't, it doesn't, it's not as potent against the next variant. There was a lot of people that talked about waning. There was people who mentioned that viruses such as SARS-CoV-2 and other related viruses that replicate at a very high rate have also, due to that high rate of replication amongst the highest of all of different different categories, uh, you know, within RNA uh, viruses, that lends itself to the creation of more mutations that can lead to selective variants that are more that have a have a greater uh, you know ability to transmit uh, and and increase and infect other people. So there were people who who did question this who did question the fact that, hey, there are new variants, so shouldn't we sort of update the delivery system or the platform of the thingy that we can't talk about? But you know what happened when people said that? They got kicked off social media. They had fact checkers that would quickly come uh, to and fact check whatever they said and said that they were spreading mis and disinformation. So, uh, you know, I, I, with all due respect, Dr. Walensky, there were people who did raise questions for this, but they were quickly censored by Tech companies, uh, they were written under the bus by by the politicians uh, and and all the, the folks on legacy media outlets for spreading dis and misinformation. So just to clarify that. So let's just pause right there. We were all hopeful about all sorts of things. Exercise, nutrition, real food, vitamin D. We were all hopeful. But when we share that same hope and that, you know, hoping that, that if we can improve people's health, we were told we're spreading misinformation and disinformation. So it sounds like, you know, there's, cognitive bias here. This is the thing that I want to bring out, and I talk about this a lot, confirmation bias. We all need to be aware of our biases, and this is why literature uh, and studies are designed, blinded, to prevent biases from being infused into the data collection and therefore the outcomes. So again, there's a lot of hope, a lot of optimism. Uh, maybe we should all be a little bit aware of our cognitive biases. I want to just give you a shout out to a book that, that, that I've read and, and share with a lot of people. It's called Decisive by the Heath Brothers, Heath Brothers, Dan and Chip Heath. They talk a lot about confirmation biases and various biases within individuals, within organizations, and we should all be aware uh, of the fact that humans are predictably irrational. So if we have an emotional sort of, uh, if we benefit emotionally or some, some sort of piece of information uh, appeals to us more emotionally, we're more likely to align with that and forget about uh, the data and be confused by that. So again, so she's being interviewed here by Dr. William Powderly, who's also a physician. Uh, and so here's the introduction here. I'm just going to play just very briefly here. So here's Dr. Rochelle Walensky. This is part of the Washington University uh, in St. Louis. I want you to pay attention to what happens right here. So watch this. It's so amazing to have everybody be super quiet all of a sudden. I think it's because the dean's here. <laughs> or maybe the head of the CDC. I'm not sure who's more powerful at this moment. Now, you might say, well, of course you want to take off the facial covering so that people can hear you. Oh, really? So now there are side effects associated with wearing a mask. Well, why haven't we given children the opportunity to hear what their teachers are saying, to be able to read and intelligence the nonverbal cues that are so important for understanding language and communication and interpersonal relationships? Well, it seems to be only important when you are in the position of power. Your children, future doctors, by the way, there are future doctors that are in school right now that are masked. Now, if you look here throughout the room, all these people are wearing masks. Here's the here why, here's why I point this out, my friends, because I went to the CDC's own updated website, cdc.gov. Right on the front here, you can put in your county. And in that county, through their new metrics that they just sort of rolled out last Friday, it was about a week ago, right? There's things I want to say about that, but I'm, not, I'm just going to pause here. All right, I'll, I'll try and keep a straight face, okay? Now, if you look here at St. Louis County, which is where this meeting is, 
presumably, unless for, there are some other branch of Washington University that's outside of St. Louis that I don't know about, but, but very sure here, that 99.9% .9 sure this, this occurred in St. Louis County. According to the CDC's own website, masks right now, because the transmission is moderate, are not recommended unless you are immunocompromised or very high risk. So as you will see here, all these individuals are masked, including the director for the CDC. So here we go. Here's Dr. Rochelle Walensky. As you can see, look at the lower right, okay? This is the this is the spouse of the former doctor who was a leader in infectious disease research, and and they're creating this grand rounds that's named after him, Gerald, uh, Gerard, Gerald, I can't remember his last name, but I'll put it there. So, so there's Dr. Walensky. Okay, remember, when she goes on stage, she takes the mask off. But when she's sitting right there, she's wearing the mask. I mean, honestly, you know she's fully vaccinated and boosted. So why is she wearing the mask when her own organization revamped and rejigged their numbers and their guidance to suggest that based upon the community level of transmission and then there's some sort of you know aggregate that also accounts for levels of hospitalization and, and hospital capacity. So she's in St. Louis. Why does she need to wear the mask? But then when she goes on stage, she takes the mask off. You, and you might be saying, well, of course she does. She wants people to hear her. Oh, so hearing the person talking matters? Oh, it does. What about all the kids where their teachers are masked and all of their fellow students are masked? We might say, well, the kids are resilient. Oh, really, are they? Have we, haven't we? have we learned now that there's developmental delay, there's changes in speech, there's a uh, you know, reduction in the number of words that kids know at certain ages and are, are they're not hitting previously uh, benchmarks that were normally sort of surpassed at certain ages. We're having to sort of roll those back a little bit. So all of a sudden now, you know, uh, it's, it's okay for older people around other older people to remove, remove their mask, but it's not okay for you or your kid to wear a mask. That's just hypocrisy. Number, number one. Okay. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what she says that science has nuance and context or areas of gray that should be appreciated. Now I, I just, I want to really focus in on this because again, this is a message we talk about all the time, whether it's, we're talking about fasting or weight loss or nutrition or sleep or, or masking, right? I've gotten in a lot of trouble for saying, do you really think and questioning people, do you really think those homemade facial coverings are doing much of anything? And I've been called every name in the book and all this sort of stuff. And I want my grandma to die and I'm, I'm promoting genocide. I mean, I've, the comments have just been totally egregious, which is not what, what I'm about anyway, as many of you know. However, it's interesting to hear the director for the Center of Disease Control actually say that, you know what, we, we try to follow the science, but as you know, the science is changing and there's gray area. Oh, really? There's, you mean there's context matters? So we shouldn't be giving, should we really be giving booster shots to 12 year olds who have already gotten COVID? Right, so let's hear what she says about science not being black or white, and there's gray area. It's gray in, in the context of this, the way in which science is being presented here, is nuance. It is it is context, meaning age, risk factors, the whole thing. So here we go with science is not as black and white as the media has made it out to be. Um, and then maybe the other thing I'll say is this area of gray. Um, I have frequently said. Um, you know, we're going to lead with the science. Science is going to be the foundation of everything we do. That is entirely true. I think public heard that as science is foolproof. Science is black and white. Science is immediate and we get the answer and then we, you know, make the decision based on the answer. And the truth is, science is great. And science is not always immediate. And it, sometimes it takes months and years to actually find out the answer. But you have to make you know, decisions in a pandemic before you have that answer. Really interesting because many of us have been talking about this. The fact that there is nuance and that science takes a little bit longer to, to sort of show. But when we said early on, exercise is helpful, we were told we were insensitive, we wanted to kill grandma, and we wanted to promote genocide. And there was no science to back it up. But she's just saying, oh yeah, sometimes it takes a little while. Why weren't we hopeful or optimistic that healthy living could have influenced the trajectory of the pandemic? In fact, I wanna play a clip very soon where she says just that. She speaks to equity in health, and equity in outcomes and how people that are living at poverty level and so forth in disadvantaged areas, if they were healthier, 
they would have fared a little bit better. But before we do, friends, I just want to welcome you all back. It's Mike Mutzel. As always, thank you for doing into these videos. If you're enjoying the content, please hit the like button. Leave a comment below. That goes a long way because, as you know, the algorithm is is really driven by engagement. So if you leave a comment, hit the like button. Also, if you think a friend that you know or work with, or if you know someone that was fired for not complying, uh, please share this video with them because I want you to hear directly from the CDC's director, uh, Rochelle Walensky, more about this. Also, my friends, if you want to inspire healthy change in your community, we have a load loads of different amazing t-shirts that are inspirational over at our sister company, Myoscience. Check it out. We have coupon codes. I will link one below. Eat like your life depends on it. We have another one. You can't beat the virus if you're eating the junk. So we are trying to encourage people to start to think a little bit better to reverse some of the maladaptive uh, things that have occurred to their body over the course of this pandemic with regards to being sedentary and staying home and eating a bunch of junk. So check out the shirts below. Use the coupon code podcast. I think you'll dig it. Now, Let's continue on here. I want to get to that clip that I was sharing with you about equity, but first let's talk a little bit more about all of the major news networks, how they had a ticker counter about how many people have died from COVID, how many cases, how many hospitalizations, how many deaths. Uh, it's interesting to hear from the director of the CDC say that mm, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> the, the easy answer is I know I'm going to be wrong for half the country. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now that I've accepted that, <laughs> um, or some some fraction of people will be unhappy. But no, I, that it's a little bit tongue in cheek. But you know, one of the things I think that's really been a challenge here is on the right side of every news screen is the number of cases and the number of deaths from COVID. And that's because we're counting them and we're looking under the lamppost of all the cases and all the deaths. And there have been so many other things that we're counting that don't make the headlines. Um, opioid deaths, um, mental health challenges, cardio, um, screening for uh, cancer screening. I, I, I'm sure you have heard from colleagues, I've heard from colleagues of people who came in, whose, whose elective surgeries were deferred, who now came in with metastatic disease. Um, so we're not telling that as much. And then she goes on to talk about how the CDC is working on changes with their metrics and their research and their marketing to talk more about cancer, heart disease, opioids, mental health, and the whole thing. But again, I, I want to point this, I want to make this point and, and talk more about this. When we talked about the other factors that were killing people and how individuals under the age of 44, we shared that plus one article back from September, how individuals under the age of 44 were more directly harmed through the indirect effects, i.e. COVID policy compared to the virus itself. When we talked about that, we were told we want to promote genocide and we want to kill everyone's grandma, which was not true. All public health policy can never save every single life. That is just not what public health policy is designed to do. It's intended to maximize the quality adjusted life years of the population, okay? So if we are we are making massive withdrawals from the, the available bank of quality adjusted life years for individuals under the age of 44, while we're maybe saving grandma, giving grandma an extra 18 months or six months or whatever, right? I mean, you know, What's the point of that? That that doesn't bring up, that doesn't rise all boats. That that disproportionately impacts uh, in a negative way the people who have the most quality adjusted life years to lose. And they go on and talk about the opioid crisis and how just last year alone there was 100,000 individuals that have died from opioid uh, you know uh, uh, challenges with overdoses, but also there's chronic disease linked with with continual opioid use, uh, heart issues, uh, brain issues. Um, the whole thing. So um, this is a major problem that has gone entirely ignored because there wasn't really sort of a, a political way, to the best of my knowledge, to weaponize this, to influence voters, right? So so you didn't hear about this. There was really no benefit of the media talking about this. Um, so it's just insane to me that uh, she can admit this, this stuff now and talk about this and everyone's okay. They're laughing. Ha ha ha. Oh, it's no big deal. Uh, meanwhile, when we would mention these things, we would get, we were thrown. If you've seen my comments from 2020 over on Instagram here on YouTube, I've had people unfollow me, uh, say I'm never supporting your business again, just all the nastiest things in the world. Yet the CDC director is saying essentially what I've been saying this entire time that, hey, people are dying from other causes and the side effects of our own COVID policy are worsening those other causes of death. They're accelerating them. 
Why don't we care about those things? Why we were just looking for a more balanced approach, stratifying, you know, telling the elderly or the medically frail to take better precautions and letting the young, healthy people sort of live their life and, and they're going to get COVID and, as is many other people. They're going to develop natural immunity and, and that's the only way to get through this whole pandemic. But we, we didn't, that was insensitive. Now, what's curious here, again, because she didn't really directly answer that good question about how do you balance the risk of infectious disease with the risks of emotional harm and, and loss of economics and challenges uh, there. Now, again, if you would have said anything about jobs or the economy or inflation, um, you were you were insensitive. But here she goes and she says, you know what, we actually in this situation, and I'll tell you why this situation that she's talking about, which is supply chain issues and uh, also uh, excessive lead times and labor crises, she talks about how she had to make a decision to cut down the duration of quarantine in individuals who are infected. So let's, let's listen to that and then talk more about that. As an infectious disease physician, I find it reasonably straightforward to be able to estimate risk of infection with COVID. However, I find it very difficult to measure the non-ID aspects of the COVID epidemic. And the CDC has had to make some tough choices. Um, and how do, you, how do you approach making these decisions with competing risk benefits, balancing the infectious risk with the, with the, econ- the risk to mental health, the economic risks, all of those things? People were surprised by our infection quarantine guidance that came out just after the holidays. We needed to make a decision. Um, something needed to be done because we were about to see a million cases a day. And we were hearing about hospitals who couldn't get blood culture bottles because FedEx wasn't delivering. They had too many people out. So we, we needed to do something. So while I do agree with most of what she said right there, you know, we need to have this balance, right? Because if we're having supply chain snafus, uh, then people are going to be harmed from those supply chain snafus. So if we can chain, you know, have a little bit more of a, of a balanced, you know, th- this idea of a zero COVID approach is just not realistic anyway. But why didn't we do that from the beginning? Why did we wait until 18 months into the crisis to then start to think about, oh, what are the consequences of our decisions? And let me back up. Why did we have labor and supply chain issues from the get-go? Well, you might remember a lot of people were fired or laid off if they didn't comply. So these were self-inflicted challenges with labor and also supply chain issues. As a consequence of that, there were unintended harms. People died. Cancellation of elective procedures, as she talks about in this interview. Cancellations of pre-cancer screening, as you just heard about. Cancer is on the rise. Uh, you know, there were child abuse issues with, with people being stuck at home, and no one seemed to care about that uh, because a lot of people, uh, teachers and, and, and folks in school, volunteers, will see a child who's been abused and will report that to Child Protective Services, right? Where there wasn't people seeing kids in school and then there was the financial stressors of being stuck at home and unemployed and so kids got abused, but you never heard about that. No one seemed to care about young children. So I, I just wonder, you know, if I had gotten fired or terminated, I would be upset by what she just said. I would be like, dude, you, we all got fired because you had a lot of optimism and not enough consideration uh, for for you know the, the long term you know how this thing was going to play out with regards to the thing that you know that we can't talk about, but yet you had no consideration for the people who got terminated for not following in line with everything that you wanted them to do, uh, and and this I have a problem with. There was very infectious doctors treating medically frail people because of a self-created labor crisis because doctors in many states, if they don't get boosted, they are essentially terminated or can't work. Their hospital privileges are revoked. So again, why are we continuing to create more unintended harms uh, as a result of our overly optimistic hope that the something is going to change the tra- trajectory of the pandemic. So uh, I, I one thing I do just want to mention, and we'll finish off here, is uh, she talks about the international aspects of this and how the CDC is involved in various international conversations and helping international doctors. You know, they bring up South Africa because the South African doctors have been instrumental in helping the world better understand Omicron. But we ignored those doctors, right? Remember so much about Amplify Black Voices, Amplify... Uh, people of color, yet when the doctors who happen to be people of color who were on international television saying, hey, 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 don't overreact about Omicron, 
No one listened to them. What did we do? We overreacted. We, we canceled flights in and out of South Africa. We didn't listen to them because, well, we got to wait until the white Caucasian European doctors and doctors in all, you know, the U.S. come up with this. We, right, yeah, we're going to take with what you say with a grain of salt. Well, it turns out they were right all along, but no one took them seriously. I remember when I shared that the same information from those doctors. Uh, guess what? People said, oh, that's disinformation. We, the U.S. doctors haven't yet confirmed or you know, verified what, what they were saying. So um, she talks about the international aspects here. And she said something curious. Let's just hear what she said. You mentioned South Africa. How, how does the CDC balance its domestic role in the United States with its global role in global public health? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have uh, collaborations in 60 countries. We have people around the world. Um, and I have had the great pleasure over the last couple of months, I've been working hard to meet with every country director um, around the world. And um, so we're, we have a keen eye on that. What's been really interesting as I've done so is, um, you know, when you speak with a country director in DRC um, and you want to talk COVID, that may or may not be the most important infectious threat that they have right now. Wait, wait, wait. How could that be? I thought this is the biggest healthcare crisis of our lifetime, and, and that sort of warranted closing of the economy and canceling everything, life, for 24 months. How can it be in, in a country, uh, you, you know, that, that doesn't have the same access to healthcare that we do, how could there possibly be another pathogen that uh, is, is more uh, problematic than COVID-19. I, I say this with tongue in cheek, of course, because of course there are bigger problems, but the media made it seem as though this was the only problem. We have politicized masking, we have politicized lockdowns, we have politicized vaccinations, uh, and and anyone who, who does questions anything else, they are a perpetuator of the pandemic. But as you just heard, there are bigger problems in the world, my friends. There are other pathogens. There are superbugs. There are antibiotic-resistant bacteria. There's drug addictions. There's homelessness. There's homicides. There's obesity in children. There's all sorts of problems that if we helped all of those things with real food, with more access to food, especially for you know individuals who are uh, at the, uh, right around the poverty level or below, we could help them. As she said, be healthier and survive this pandemic and do better uh, with that, with this with this particular virus. But all that's been ignored, right? Because we are focusing so much on masking and politicizing masking and criticizing people who tell children that they can take the mask off if they want, right? We, we create all these this political fodder when we should, should have been focusing on health from the get-go. And that's been my message and continues to be my message because the data has been there from the get-go. Exercise, real food, managing your stress, getting outside, getting sunlight, vitamin D, balancing your circadian clock system, prioritizing relationships and sleep. Those things improve health, my friend. So what do you think of these clips? Let me know in the comments below. Let me know what you think about this. I'm not trying to continue to stir the pot. I'm just trying to present to you things that many of us have said, and we took a lot of heat for saying that. And that's why I'm sharing this with you because it was frustrating. We were talking because we, we've we we've seen this research, we've seen uh, the data that was coming out of, of peer reviewed studies. So we would talk about these things and we would catch a lot of flack. And now the director of the CDC is echoing much of the same messages that many of you have been saying. And, and we lost family and friends as a result of it, meaning that they wanted to distance themselves from us. And, it, and it's been challenging. That's why that's why I share this with you, my friend. So anyway, hope you, hopefully you enjoyed this video. Thanks for hitting that like button. We will catch you on a future episode down the, down the road. Take care now. Yeah.